Hello. This work. Uh, I'm coming to you from a, a different location than usual, so I hope this works out well. So welcome all. My name is Roger Berkowitz, again, the founder and academic director of the Hannah Arendt Center. And um, we are uh, still engaged in this long, but I think increasingly relevant reading of uh, Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism. Um, we're discussing today chapter 11, the totalitarian movement. Um, just a, a reminder, um, she defines totalitarian movements uh, on page 323 in the last chapter, uh, to saying that totalitarian movements are mass organizations of atomized, isolated individuals. Um, I keep coming back to that quotation because I think in that quote, um, as we continue to read the book, you see over and over again uh, what under, RN understands uh, this to mean. So um, they are mass organizations of atomized, isolated individuals, but they're movements. And this chapter, chapter 11, that we're talking about today, asks the question, what is a movement? And it has two parts. Uh, the first part is on propaganda. And so uh, one essential aspect of um, a movement is that it uses propaganda um, to win over the masses. Um, uh, she says in the first line, it's worth paying attention, only the mob and the elite can be attracted by the momentum of totalitarianism itself. The masses have to be won by propaganda. And this is uh, important for a number of reasons, but on the one hand, it begins to tell us the differentiations um, between the different parts of totalitarian movements. Um, the totalitarian movement will encompass the mob. They will also, to a certain extent, encompass the elite. Uh, and they will also need the masses. Um, propaganda is aimed at the masses. Uh, the other sides, the other, the mob joins for other reasons, the elite joins for other reasons. Um, so the first part of the chapter is on propaganda, and the second is on organization, totalitarian organization. Um, these two ideas, organization and propaganda, go together. Uh, they are, as she says, two sides of the same coin. They're really the way that um, a totalitarian movement um, uh, holds to its loyalty and in both recruits people and 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 holds them in place uh and and here is is where she's really um uh trying to think through how they do it um the first part uh of the and let me say and here it gets complicated it gets you know at times we get there's a lot of footnotes in this chapter uh most of them to texts written by Nazis, uh, and they're really about um, how we as Nazis will uh, generate the momentum of the movement, attract people to it, and, and have it continue. Um, and one of the things that she talks about is that propaganda is really for the uninitiated, for the those who don't yet believe. Um, the, the party members don't really consume the propaganda. The propaganda is not for them. It's for uh, uh, people on the outside. And I think it's something that is very hard for, I know hard for me uh, to get a grip around because we often think of the Nazis and their propaganda is aimed at the Nazis, is aimed at the, par at the party. And, you know, today, to the extent we think of movements as happening, whether it's the uh, movement of the Trump voters or the movement of the left, we think that people are speaking to their initiated. And yet what Arendt is telling us is that in so many ways, the, the initiated are already there. Once they're caught up in it, they don't need the propaganda and the propaganda is made for the outside world. Um, so in the in in this in the on the question of propaganda um there's there's a number of, of of really important elements that she's that she addresses but to me what it really comes down to is that what propaganda does uh and what the movement does is it has to create a lying fictional world and this is um 
something that I think is easy to sort of say and easy to read about, and easy to talk about. But I mean, how hard is it in a world to create an entire reality that is fictional, that is cut off from um, truth? I've been, uh, some of you I'm sure have read Orwell's 1984 and I'm gonna be, there's a, a, a day across the country in April where they're showing this the movie of the book uh, and I'm gonna be speaking at one of them, so I'm rereading it now. And it's just um, amazing to me, you know, how it seems, how, how, how that, that party, INGSOC, the English Socialist Party in this, in this case, has gone about creating a world of reality that even people who know it to be untrue can't seem to pierce. Um, and, and that's what Arendt is here uh, talking about, how you do that. Um, and uh, the, the, the key element, uh, as comes up uh, repeatedly and often in our reading, is this idea of fictionalization. Um, and I, I, I talked about it in the video, some of you have watched, um, but I'm happy to answer questions about it. But the, the, key, the key passages, again, are, are about this idea that, um, that she expresses, I think, on page 352 and 353 in ways that are absolutely necessary for understanding this book. So I'm just gonna read a couple of sections and have these in our heads. She writes on 352, the chief disability of totalitarian propaganda is that it cannot fulfill this longing of the masses for a completely consistent, comprehensible, and predictable world without seriously conflicting with common sense. Right? This is why totalitarian propaganda is so hard. Because if you're going to tell people that the Jews are the cause of all their problems, the problem is that common sense says this is ridiculous. The Jews are a small people. Most of us don't know any Jews. You can't really be serious. And so it just conflicts with common sense. And so she adds, if, for instance, all the confessions of political opponents in the Soviet Union are phrased in the same language and admit the same motives, the consistency hungry masses will accept the fiction as supreme proof of their truthfulness. Whereas common sense tells us that it is precisely their consistency, which is out of this world and proves that they are a fabrication. So how do you overcome common sense? And that's what totalitarian movements have to do. Figuratively speaking, it is as though the masses demand a constant repetition of the miracle of the Septuagint, when according to ancient legends, 70 isolated translators produced an identical Greek version of the Old Testament. Common sense can accept this tale only as a legend or a miracle, yet it could also be adduced as proof of the absolute faithfulness of every single word in the translated text. And so this is the problem that any totalitarian movement is going to face. So if you're interested in the question of whether someone like the Trump movement is a totalitarian movement, or whether, for example, the left's movement today, the alt-right or the alt-left are totalitarian movements, you need to ask yourself, can they and how do they overcome common sense? And one advantage they have, she says, is that um, the masses are obsessed by a desire to escape from reality. And she says this in the next sentence, because in their essential homelessness, they can no longer bear its accidental, incomprehensible aspects. It is also true that their longing for fiction has some connection with those capacities of the human mind whose structural consistency is superior to mere occurrence. And this is, again, part of the argument of the book that totalitarianism is a new form of government that really is different from all former authoritarian governments and couldn't have existed. And the, that one of the essential conditions for it is this new homelessness, this new loneliness of modern man, um, in which humans today are so lonely uh, and homeless that they can no longer bear reality. The fact that reality is incomprehensible and accidental. And they actually yearn for a consistent reality, one that's coherent, consistent, and reliable. And that's why um, totalitarianism can succeed in the modern world. Because even though it is an insult to common sense, common sense has lost its validity in a world in which people no longer trust reality. Um, 
and this is and this is the advantage that totalitarianism has in the 20th and I think also in the 21st centuries. And this leads to um, to me one of the the paragraphs of the book that I find most compelling and that I return to all the time on page 353. And she says, before they seize power and establish a world according to their doctrines, totalitarian movements conjure up a lying world of consistency, which is more adequate to the needs of the human mind than reality itself. I mean, more adequate to the needs of the human mind than reality itself, in which through sheer imagination, uprooted masses can feel at home and are spared the never ending shocks which real life and real experiences deal to human beings and their expectations. The force possessed by totalitarian propaganda lies in its ability to shut the masses off from the real world. And, and this fictionalization, this shutting off from the real world is what both propaganda and organization do. So if you then, we turn to the second part of the chapter on totalitarian organization, once again, the mark of totalitarian organization is that it creates front organizations, secret societies, uh, elite formations, the leader, all of which are designed to do one thing, to shut people off, to shut the masses, to shut people off from the real world, to allow them to live in this fake, cons consistent, coherent world. And, um, one of the absolute essential uh, requirements of that is that they don't see the real, the fictional world that they live in as fictional, that they see it as true, that they don't allow common sense to intrude upon the ridiculous consistencies of that fictional world. And I see the the, the, the line, the, the paragraph in which Arendt expresses how this is done, which is the one scariest to me right now in our world, our current world, uh, is takes place on page 384 to 385. And it's the one Bob Meyerson, I think, is referring to in his question, which we'll get to in a second. <clears throat> but she writes at the bottom of 384. <clears throat> the elite formations are distinguished from the ordinary party membership in that they do not need such demonstrations, namely the demonstrations of um, fact, of, of how the facts can conform to the world. They are not even supposed to believe in the literal truth of ideological cliches, the elite formations. I mean, this is one of those things you ask, you know, do, does Bannon, does Trump, do, do the elites of a totalitarian movement or a pre-totalitarian movement um, believe in what they're saying? And RN says, no, they don't have to. In fact, they're not supposed to. Um, these are fabricated to answer a quest for truth among the masses. The cliches, the ideologies are not there because the people who espouse them believe them. They're there because they answer a need, the deep need of the human mind to believe in something, in truth. And um, she continues, the elite is not composed of ideologists. Its members' whole education is aimed at abolishing their capacity for distinguishing between truth and falsehood, between reality and fiction. Their superiority consists in their ability immediately to dissolve every statement of fact into a declaration of purpose. I'm going to read that again. Their superiority consists in their ability to immediately dissolve every statement of fact into a declaration of purpose. Um, they are elite because what they are good at is understanding that facts don't matter, that what matters are purposes, that what people want are truths, what people want are consistent ideologies. They want to believe something that's constant. And what the elite are able to do is turn away from uh, turn away from facts and say that this statement of fact doesn't matter. What it matters is the truth it represents. And to just use a couple of examples, right? 
when when the president says I have the biggest inauguration ever, he's not saying there's a fact out there that I have the biggest inauguration ever. What he's saying is I'm a legitimate president. And he's speaking to those who want to legitimate his presidency. Um, and he's speaking in what Arendt here calls declarations of purpose, not statements of fact. And what he and his uh, elite um, uh, representatives are incredibly adept at doing is dissolving every statement of fact into declarations of purpose. How did they learn that, Bob? M Bob asks, Bob Meyerson asks, um, did they read Arendt? I highly doubt it, although we should never underestimate them. And Steve Bannon is a voracious reader and clearly a very intelligent man. Um, as is, I, Trump may not be a voracious reader, but he's certainly a very intelligent man. Uh, Bob asks, is Trump's marrying a pretend concern for pre-existing condition insurance, the insurance and precondition infrastructure projects and gay rights with tax breaks, regulatory holidays and brutal expulsions are a prize of the Nazi joining of nationalism and socialism. Just how intentional is Trump? Well, I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, I, I don't think any of us do right now. And he certainly is not yet a totalitarian ruler in any shape of the imagination, um, uh, in the sense that he doesn't yet rule over a uh, a, a lawless, uh, terroristic enterprise. And we should never confuse that. I mean, we should be very clear. He's not. But there's no doubt that the um, incredible aptitude and willingness he shows to dissolve facts into purposes is deeply, deeply connected to the construction of a fictional world and the uh, rejection of reality that um, is a deep uh, part of totalitarianism uh, and the idea of a totalitarian movement. And we should remember that Trump consistently says that he is not running and he didn't run a normal election campaign. He was running a movement. And he now, as president, has immediately, uh, you know, immediately said that he's going to continue raising money and, and working towards a campaign and that he turns towards campaign style events. There's no doubt that he has, for however, whatever reasons, intuited or hit upon the importance of a movement and the importance that a movement plays in um, organizing the masses. And the masses are not all his people and not all his people are the masses. I mean, Bob Meyerson has been, I think, very good to continually to remind us that, and, and I think he's absolutely right, that a large number and maybe even a majority of the people who support Trump are not, you know, are not the party members, right? Um, they're not the, 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 the dyed in the wool members. And they're not all, um, uh, you know, white working class. Um, there's a lot of different groups that support him. And RN here talks about the need for these front organizations, the sympathizers, who, in a sense, are a buffer between sort of the, the true believers and the outside world. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and so all of these uh, insights that she has into the way a movement maintains itself through propaganda and organization as a fictional world are, I think, things we need to be deeply alert to today um, and, um, and are at the very root of what she understands the workings and success of a totalitarian movement to be. Um, okay, uh, I see Barry uh, has a two-part question, which is we should carefully discuss and mutually distinguish among masses, movement, and mob. The first and last, masses and movement, I assume, are aspects of the classless society, which Arendt notes plays a crucial role in the formation of the totalitarian movement. Um, I would have not put mob in that, Barry. I don't know if you want to respond to that. The mob for her is still part of a class society. Uh, it's still part of generally the lower class that wants power and wealth. Um, uh, it's the movement 
it's the masses that uh, are the detritus of all the classes that emerge and are part of the totalitarian movement. Um, Am I on the air? Or, or, uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, mob comes up, came up, of course, in the last chapter, but occasionally in this one. And I don't agree that it's only lower classes. You've had all kinds of mobs of middle class people going after uh, uh, workers in America. Uh, you had mobs of all kinds, uh, Nazi mobs and so on. Uh, to me, uh, masses would be that undifferentiated, uh, as she says, alienated, atomized society who have been uh, freed from uh, institutional and other forms of, um, of life um, and are adrift. Uh, and they become a mob when becoming furious. So the mass, the, the mass is more of a inert, the mob more of a, an active uh, section of the mass. Um, that's how I would dif differentiate between these two. Thank you. Yeah. So I think I've said this once or twice in earlier sessions as well, that the mass, the distinction between the masses and the mob um, is, I think, one of the more difficult and I also would add less consistent um, uh, distinctions she makes uh, in, in, in the book. Um, on the one hand, I think there are differences as she understands them, but they often overlap and, 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 and bleed into each other. And um, I'm not someone who believes deeply that it's absolutely imperative to sort of try and give precise definitions of either one, because I don't know if they, I think they're, they're, they're sort of generalized ideas on both of her parts. But um, what, I, what I do think is clear is that um, the, the masses are for her, the neutral, politically neutral people, the detritus of all the classes. That I know is, is her point. And that the masses are what emerge in the aftermath of the breakdown of the classes in the class society. So that's that's part of her argument. Um, the mob, and I think you're right, Barry. She uh, she at times, I don't think it's only the lower classes, but I think what she thinks of the mob as is the um, uh, are the are the the, the, the people who are motivated by power and money, right? I think in a way that's one- They could also distinction. be motivated by revenge, uh, yeah. by, uh, as she says herself, fury. She uses the word and fury. fury. Yeah. So indeed it could I, be a variety of things that sets them off resentment, profound yeah. resentment in the Nietzschean sense. Um, okay, I think that's all fair. Um, I think money, power, to a certain extent resentment, um, whereas the masses are motivated by something else. Um, the masses are motivated by um, being part of, uh, 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 as, as Himmler says, uh, being part of a 2000 year old mo Reich movement. They want to create a movement that will make, that will be meaningful. So the masses are, are motivated by a desire to be part of a winning, victorious, uh, movement that will give their lives meaning. And thus they're not motivated by the usual material elements that classes are motivated by. Um, and usually what she would say, the mob. So um, I think if that works, uh, I would say that's where we, we could, we would agree. Um, uh, the, mo the, the masses are part of a movement um, which plays an incredible role in the formation of the totalitarian movements. Um, where does the mob play a role? The mob plays a role um, in, uh, in, on the one hand, being mobilized by the elite and mobilized by the movement, and also um, in, uh, in, what, in that fascinating part of the end of chapter 10, the, 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 the alliance, the temporary alliance between the mob and the elite, where what the mob does is um, revel in the breakdown of moral standards in society and embrace the elite's cynicism and nihilism um, when the elite 
laughs at and enjoys seeing the mob uh, destroy the uh, morality and uh, of morality and institutions of, of of good proper society. And so the mob is important in that early stage of totalitarianism in um, in a sense working with the elite to break down the taboos against immoral and uh, and violent acts. Um, at least that's how I have understood it. Uh, I, I've, I've admitted, I'll admit it again, this is one of the harder parts of her work to understand for me, the real distinction between mob and, and mass. Um, and uh, she doesn't really ever come back to it in any of her other works. It's not something she, she, she focuses on later. So I, I leave it at that for now. Is that all right, Barry? Okay, fine. <laughs> okay, sorry. So, that right, we'll, we'll see what we can do as we go forward. Um, uh, Johanna, Johanna, yeah, Jack, you want to say something? Yeah, I I, I want to say something about the um, uh, the the longing for consistency. I think one of the things that one of the things that she points out as the function of propaganda is to draw on um, uh, uh, draw on existing ideologies which are not working for the people. It's kind of like out there in the air and people are looking for some way to draw together ideological assumptions or ideological ideas that will give their lives a, se a sense of purpose. And what the propaganda does is it takes ideas that are out there doesn't even create any new ideas, just ideas that are out there and places them in such a way that the mass, the masses can attach to them and follow and follow their way into the part into the movement, I guess I was about to say party, but into the movement. And and the the function of the mob is, I think, I, I don't know that it's I, I, she's reading that into the history as she knew it. Which, which is that the totalitarian movements that she was describing did in fact begin with mob action. But I don't, I'm not so sure that the, uh, the behavior of the mob is essential. And in fact, I, the way I look at the, the history itself, I think that Hitler's dissolution of the SA was really an attempt to reduce the power of the mob in the movement. Um. Uh, well, I, I happen to agree with you, Jack. I mean, I, I, I think the mob is a very important part of the pre-totalitarian uh, structure for her. Um, and what it largely does is uh, help uh, attack the, the moral and bourgeois and institutional standards um, that are already f being seen to be rotten and corrupt. Roger, uh, may I just... Yeah, go ahead, Barry. But the mob, the mob is really a, a kind of first harbinger of terror. Uh, the mob is a terroristic uh, group, uh, which, when uh, channeled into uh, some kind of uh, organization, becomes the SA or the equivalent thereof. I think that's true as well. Um, and it's that harbinger of terror. It's that willingness to use violence. That willingness to laugh at moral standards. Um, and say, you know, you can la you can you can talk about morality, but we're going to win. Um, uh, which, uh, on the one hand, begins to challenge those moral standards and break them down, which is essential, but also um, corrupts the elite, corrupts those who, from our end's point of view, should be um, above that, and who come to sort of see it as a joke, and come to see it as uh, satire, and come to enjoy the satire of seeing the false elites, the hypocrites, um, upended and, and sent up. Um, but to combine what I think you and Jack are both saying, which I think is right, once a totalitarian movement really emerges and enters into either becomes almost powerful or comes to be in power, the mob is harder to control because they actually have interests that they want. They aren't going to be simply manipulated by propaganda and organization. They, they actually want to achieve certain things. And that's when the mob needs to be um, uh, either broken up or, or, or challenged by a totalitarian power. Because what totalitarianism can't abide 
is any group that actually has common sense interests. Because if you have common sense interests, um, you actually want to achieve those. I mean, this is an interesting question with what's going on right now in the world around health care and other things. You know, there's a big question of whether Trump's budget is going to upset his core followers, people ask, because it's not actually providing them with the economic payoff of having him in office. Um, and I think the the argument of I mean the the, the assumption of Trump and and his and his um, you know helpers is that doesn't matter because our our core constituency are not are neither classes nor mobs. They are people who want to be part of a movement, and what they care about is that the Trump movement succeeds, and they care more about that than they care about any particular outcome. And um, if that's the argument, again, I'm not sure, but if that's the argument and thought behind what Trump is doing, he's very much in line with what Arendt is arguing here about a totalitarian movement. All right, we can come back to this. I'll go on. Johanna Fisher writes, an important point to ponder, how does one respond to what we are witnessing, the pretense to acting in the interest of a mass? How is it possible so many are acting count? Okay, so this is the exact question we were just talking about. The only, the only thing I would, I would say, Johanna, is that I don't think Trump is, has a pretense in acting to the interest of a mass. He has a pretense of acting in the interest of a class or of a mob. I mean, this is this distinction. Mass doesn't have an interest outside of the interest of the uh, the movement. What the mass wants is um, the security and stability and coherence of a movement that seems victorious. And so if you think about it this way, if Trump succeeds, what is success? Okay. If Trump not only serves out four years, but maybe gets reelected. If Trump succeeds in um, uh, radically transforming the bureaucracy and the way government is done, if he succeeds in challenging political correctness, um, if he succeeds in these ways, there will be a, co a core group of his followers who will feel emboldened and affirmed simply by being part of that movement. And it doesn't so much matter to them the material consequences. Now, there are others who voted for Trump, not because they're part of a movement, but because they have class or other interests, and they may be upset, right? Um, and so that's a calculation that someone like Trump has to make. But, uh, but I don't think the material failures of his administration to help poorer people is going to impact him with his core supporters, which what they want is membership in a movement. Uh, Jack asks, or writes to Bob, Bannon has probably read RN, although not necessarily this book. I, I have no idea. I don't know why we would think that, but it's interesting. I'd like to know. Trump probably not. Not too many people have read RN, and it's a pity. <laughs> okay. Uh, Willa Franz writes, uh, can we see a current example of totalitarianism in North Korea where the Kim family, generation to generation, constitute the equivalent of leader? After all, RN was working with two examples and drawing deductions from them. Um, you know, the answer to that, Willa, is I think so, but I'm not an expert on North Korea, but it seems about as good an ex a good uh, example of a totalitarian regime as we have. Maybe a couple others in the world would rival it, but I'm no expert in, in North Korea. If you have more information and you'd like to add uh, to it, um, we, we would certainly listen. Um, Susan writes, could you talk a little bit about Hitler in Mein Kampf, which I haven't read, and Himmler came up with and articulated their ideas so effectively and cogently? Uh, is someone trying to talk? I'm hearing somebody's mic, so. Um, all right, could you turn your mic off if you're not talking? 
Uh, how did, what? Uh, so, Willa, did you want to say something? Uh, where's my... You got uh, it on. No, thanks. I, uh, 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 I was getting, actually with the North Korea point, I was getting at an example of a, cur of a current example, because Erin was working with what she had known and lived through, uh, and of course North Korea was just emerging at the time that she was writing this, so it was not a full-blown Kim dynasty that we know now. So um, uh, I, I was thinking of, do we have something currently that we might consider the destination of what we see Trump trying to do now? That's all. Thank you. I, I mean, I, I think I think you're right to point it out, and I think that North Korea, from what I can tell, is would certainly now fit within what she would call a totalitarian organization. Um, and studying it would be a great opportunity. Um, I just haven't done it, and uh, we should. Um, as for Susan Tucker's question about Mein Kampf and Himmler and Hitler, uh, how? Well, I, that's a good question. Uh, you know, uh, there's a um, uh, there's a great documentary about Himmler that I would recommend to all of you if you haven't seen it called um, The Decent One, Der Anständige. Uh, we've shown it at the RN Center a number of times, and it's based on his diaries, uh, which were found about 10 years ago. Um, I, you know, interestingly, you learn a lot about Himmler. He was sort of a middle range college student, not that distinguished in any way. Um, how did he gain these insights? How did Hitler gain these insights? Uh, I would say they had a, an incredible uh, insight into the deep needs of the mass man in the 20th century. Um, were they themselves part of the masses? Uh, I think the answer, the answer, I think, would RN says no. RN says that they came out of, out of the um, mob. Um, but she says also that future leaders could come out of the masses. In some way, I think of them as part of the masses and that they, their understanding of the loneliness and homelessness of the masses is what allowed them to uh, so uh, appeal to and attract the masses. And yet they were not simply the masses. They had something, they had an insight into it that, that allowed them to manipulate and use the masses. Um, and clearly, I mean, one of the, you know, I mean, again, I, I, I use the I use the example of Trump not because I think Trump is the only dangerous figure in the modern world. He's not, um, and I think there are many on the left who are part of a movement, um, just like I think many on the right are part of a movement. But Trump is a in power, and b um, he is more so than almost anyone else that I know of in public office today, and in public life today willing to go to the radical extreme of denial of facts and the use of purposive as opposed to factual uh, language. Um, he just doesn't seem to in any way be restrained by the need to speak in a way that is um, commonsensical. And uh, that is an extraordinary, well, what do we want to call it? Talent? Facility? Um, uh, you know, it's dangerous, but it's also a talent. He he understands that if you keep saying Obama, you know, wiretapped me or I used air quotes or I used this, what will he never have to do? He will never have to apologize. He will never have to say I was wrong. He will never have to say I made a mistake. And that's what uh, that's what RN says a totalitarian leader can never do because they have to be prophetic. I mean, and you see this in his examples. I mean, he said for eight years that Obama was not a citizen and that he didn't have a real birth certificate. And then when finally enough Republicans came out and said, this is ridiculous, you have to admit reality. Did he say I was wrong? Never. He said, of course, he's a citizen. But he, and he said, I was the one who helped bring up this question. I was helped. He never said, I'm sorry. He never said I was wrong. It's, an, it's, a, it's a technique that he uses with incredible precision 
and power. And other people could do it if they just had no concern with people thinking they were idiots. But he doesn't have that concern. And the result is he wins. He wins. And um, so how did he learn it? You know, did he read Hannah Arendt? I highly doubt it. How did he learn it? Did he read Himmler? How did Himmler learn it? How did Hitler learn it? There are people who understand these things. They're usually people we call salesmen. But sometimes the salesmen enter a different world uh, and, and they have an incredible insight into human nature. And don't take that away from Trump. You know, um, don't take it away from Milo Yiannopoulos. Don't take it away from Lucian Wintrich, who I have coming to speak to at Bard in a couple of weeks, and people are very upset about it. Well, listen to the guys and learn how effective they are, because you're going to have to argue with them at some point. And what they are is incredibly good at making us look silly when we try and say, but that's not a fact. That's not real. And you have to learn how to do that. You have to learn how to respond. And I don't know. I'm not the person who's going to tell you how to do it. Um, I'm trying to teach you what's happening or what Arendt thought was happening and offer that as a, as a way of helping to understand where we're at. That's how I understand what I'm doing. But we have all a lot of work to do to try and understand how to respond to this kind of complete denial of reality and common sense in the name of factual consistency. I'm sorry, ideological consistency. Uh, Roger. Uh, Joseph. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I, I think the point that you've just made is really very important. And uh, a problem is that when you look at the uh, when you look at these people who that not only uh, Trump but the people around him who come forward with uh, uh, denial of fact. If, uh, that's the best way for me to describe it. Um, you there's many ways you can characterize it. You can say that they're sociopaths. You can say that they're con men. You can say as we do that they are perhaps pre, uh, 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 pre-totalitarian, but whatever they are, the important thing is to be able to uh, understand how to uh, retranslate that to the people who are listening. That's, I think, the, the, the issue, because when, when Trump lies to me, I say, oh, okay, it's a lie, but that I'm powerless in that situation. I only have power if there is some way for me or you or all of us or whatever to expose that lie in a way that the people who are willing to accept it will question it. And I don't know what the answer to that is either, but I think it's extremely important that that happen or else Mein Kampf becomes the Bible. I think it's an important point, Jack. I mean, I, I've been, I think I've mentioned this. I've been talking to uh, one or two journalists who, you know, off the record, and they're trying to figure out how to respond to Trump, right? How do you, you know, they, they came to me and said, look, fact checking is not working. What, why not? And I tried to give them answers and they seemed to like the answers, but then said, oh, what's the next step? How do you, how do you respond as a journalist or as a politician or as a citizen to these kinds of assaults on common sense? Um, and uh, on one level, the answer is you simply have to refuse to give in. I mean, I think what is surprising Trump right now is how hard it is for him to continue this idea of, um, you know, Obama wiretapped him and not, not say no. But what you're seeing is that the mistake that some of the people are making is they're saying there's no evidence for it. They're not demanding he retract it. Or if they are, when he doesn't retract it, there's no consequences. At some point, you have to be willing to stand up and lose and, 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 and challenge him. And if you lose, you lose. <laughs> but you, people are going to have to challenge him. And the problem is that throughout the Republican primary and throughout the election, now throughout his presidency so far, everyone who challenges them challenges them alone. And then when Trump demolishes them, they walk away with their, you know, tail between their legs and the next person who gets the temerity to, to challenge him, that same thing happens. Someone's going to have to organize a group of people who challenge him. 
And um, it's a very difficult thing to do right now because all of these people want, they're not yet convinced they can't, they can't use him um, and that they want something from him. And uh, at some point, I, I hope people will give up on that and challenge him, but it's not clear. Um, but I do think it's an important question of how do you respond? I, and uh, I think that the, the key thing is you can't just roll over. All of us in the press, in academia, in our lives, we have to continue to say, I know what reality is. And, I'm, and I have to say, I am in general heartened by much of the reaction to this statement of Trump's. People have not rolled over. It's still in the news. I don't know how many days after it happened. It's not disappearing. And um, to me, that's a credit to those who are keeping it alive. And we should be praising them, the journalists and also the politicians risking themselves to do it. Now, I think they should do more, but we this is the way to do it. Because at some point, as I read earlier, in RN says, totalitarianism has a very hard job. It has to go against common sense. And um, in the end, she thinks, and this comes, we'll read this in the last two chapters of the book. She thinks totalitarianisms always lose because in the end, it's impossible to fully obliterate common sense. Um, and so, you know, it can happen for a short period of time, but eventually it ends. Um, and, uh, you know, that's where I think we're at. I, but I don't think we're at there yet because people are still reacting with common sense. Roger, could I say, uh, say a little bit about that? I don't think just saying that a lie is a lie because he throws off so many, you'd be chasing your tail trying to figure out which is the most important one. Because his true believers aren't paying any attention to the factual parts. They're simply paying attention that he's keeping everybody uncomfortable, whether it's the size of the crowd or the electoral vote. It's all, this is all, if, if we keep chasing those throw off lines, so to speak, meaningless throw off lines that don't affect anything, it just provides a cover for bigger lies. Muslims aren't ready to invade the country until he puts up you know, some kind of uh, military thing, you know, fifty billion dollars more, and all that kind of stuff. So the true believers probably aren't going to the, to the immediate, in my mind's eye, that the only ones, if the Republicans continue to front him, protecting him, with, even with the obvious stuff, why would you have to press Ryan hour after hour to make him state the obvious that there's a lie going on about the, the wiretapping? Um, th th that's all my, one of those front people that she talks about, the, you know, the, the fronts and all that kind of stuff, protecting the craziness. And the inner guys know it's a lie. They know what the hell is going on. Uh, and as embarrassed as they are, must, must be to get out there acting like fools. That as long as that front, that right now it happens to me, it happens to be the con congressional Republicans are just simply buffering him from any kind of reality. Because if he gets that if he does get that Muslim ban, then that's a big lie that he, you know what I mean? He sort of buttresses the lie that we're being you know, ready for an invasion of, of jihadists at the borders. Uh, he gets over that big lie. Uh, that's a tough one for us to combat, I think. So, Pat, as far as I can tell, you raise a tactical question, right? And it's a tactical question. Do you let the small lies go and focus on the big lies, or do you address all the lies? And I think it's an important question of tactics. And what I would say is you can't just let the small lies go. You have to fight back on each one. That doesn't mean you have to lay your life down on the small lies, right? I mean, but I think you have to let people know what he's doing um, and that this is the way a fictional world is created. Um, it's absolutely essential that there be questions raised about him at every level. That's a tactical question. It's, I happen to think that's my tactical approach. Um, I, I, you know, I could be wrong, um, but, uh, but I think you have, to, you have to push on each one of these lies, misstatements, purpose of no, I, struggle. I didn't mean, 
I didn't mean to suggest that you ignore the, the throw out lines. I, I mean that you don't spend hours on them as you have done on this wiretapping. The bigger, there are big lies going on here about the budget that he put forward. What you, you indicated it, you know, what, what damage he'll be doing to, uh, you know, people that think they <laughs> that think he's on their side. Those are bigger lies. And, that's, and not that you that's, were, I, I, let me let me respond. Anyway, to that. I'm not I'm not disputing I'm not disputing the small ones. You have to you have to sort of hold them up on all of them, but not to put the emphasis as some of the media does. I'm sorry. But I mean, here's actually a tactic that I think is is very dangerous, right? On the budget, he's not lying, right? He's telling you what he wants to do on the budget, and just call him. To say he's lying about the budget, I think, is a mistake. He's telling you what he wants to do. Um, and I think when when people respond to the budget and and say, oh, you know, and, and associate it with the same kind of lying and dissembling that you see elsewhere, it actually makes the left look bad. And it makes the left look as willing to dissemble and lie at times as the right. And I think it's a, we're at a point where the left has to be very, and it's not just the left, the non-Trump right and the non-Trump left have to be very careful now to try and not give in to the obvious impulse, which is to exaggerate and, conf and, and, and create fabrications on the other side. Um, you can argue against the budget as a policy issue all you want, and I, I hope you do, and many do, but that's a policy issue, and that's not where he's... Um, he may be dangerous to particular class interests there, but that's not where he's dangerous as a totalitarian, and we just have to keep that separate. Um, I, you know, I think some people think, well, who cares about it's totalitarian? His budget is more realistically dangerous to people's lives than his lie about Obama wiretapping him, and maybe that's your point. Fine, uh, that may be true, but it's a, but that's. But that would be the same for any other Republican who or conservative who was in office and uh, and had different policy agendas than than the left. Um, so uh, I think it's important to separate those two critiques, I guess, is part of my what I'm trying to say. So Pat, I think, uh, raises a very important point, which is the role of the fellow traveler, as discussed by Hannah Arendt. And in today's world, I see the Republican Congress as a group of fellow travelers. Um, and so the fellow travelers are uh, something that she doesn't speak about, which is the motivation of the fellow travelers. The fellow travelers are usually motivated by fear. And so if we want to, if there's anybody in this group who is participating in this meeting who wants to um, work to oppose what appears to be a, a pre-totalitarian movement, then a place to begin is to um, reduce the fear of the fellow travelers, to get to what it is that they're afraid of, and to, um, in my opinion, actually make them afraid of the, the opposite, right? So, so that, for example, the, the, uh, uh, the, one of the things in the, in the Congress clearly is that everybody wants to hold his seat. And there's some apparently some belief that if they oppose Trump, they will lose their seat. And somehow we need to persuade them that if they don't oppose Trump, they will lose their seat. Um, but I, I mean, that's very oversimplified, obviously. But I, I think the, my, my, the point I really want to make is that the fellow travelers, of which there are many and probably many more than true believers, um, are motivated by fear. And in some ways, the consistency that he puts forward uh, it, it becomes a trap for them because they can easily become members of the movement. But, um, but I think that keeping them from becoming members of the movement is a very important part of whatever it is that people want to do. Jack, I think that's well said. I, I, would, I don't think it's only fear. I think a lot of them are motivated by opportunity. Um, you know, a, a lot of these, a lot of people have been, a lot of people on the, in the Republican right have been chomping at the bit to, ha to make real changes in government. 
some not, but some have, and they see uh, a Republican majority in both houses and a Republican president, and they're hoping they can use this president and his power to uh, carry out parts of the agenda that they've been wanting to uh, carry out. Um, uh, so I think that there's some of them are are actually idealists. Some are, and but they're all afraid of they all afraid of losing their seat. That's just by definition. So um, anyway, but uh, let's move on. Joseph asks, do we know what the original German for mob is here? It's mob. Um, first of all, this is the original in the sense that she wrote the book in English. She translated it into German later. Um, but I believe the word in German is mob. Um, it seems likely that some of our confusion about this concept could be stemming from the double meaning that the word has in English, both organized crime, okay, good, and spontaneously organized crowds. I think that's right. Um, so she's not here talking about organized crime so much as she is talking about the spontaneously organized um, crowds. Um, she does talk about organized crime insofar as she thinks that um, the mob in that sense enters into business and becomes hard to distinguish from traditional uh, upstanding businessmen. Um, and that that's part of the mob-like reduction of morality that goes on. Um, so, but, so she does use it in both senses, but the primary sense is more the, the organized crowds and it's not just rioting and sudden violence. Actually, it, it, it's it's more the sense of the uh, the people who um, are feel unjustly to have been deprived of their due of power or money, and thus are willing to organize and engage in criminal activity, either organized or unorganized, um, in order to. Uh, um, in order to uh, get what they think they deserve. And Joachim, yes, that is the mob, right? Um, Paul asks as to North Korea or points out there is an excellent book, The Cleanest Race by B.R. Myers. I don't know it. Many points in the book echo Arendt. He points out that what is Yush, Yush philosophy and other NK propaganda is largely for foreign rather than domestic consumption, and that there is a pan aspect, as NK claims to be the true representative of the Korean race. Juche. Juche. Thank you. I, I, as I said, I don't know much about North Korea, but thank you. That sounds great. Um, Dina asks, if the masses support movements because of a need for consistency that reality otherwise does not provide, are movements an expression of the human condition and thus inevitable? Um, that's a great question. Um, it's not that they're part of the human condition, um, uh, but it, but uh, they are, I think, Arendt believes, part of um, the human uh, world in the 20th century moving forward. Now that can change at some point, but at a at a time in which um, th uh, many of the traditional uh, beliefs and activities that have given man a sense of consistency and meaning in the world, religion, tradition, um, static cultural lives, uh, have broken down. And there's this movements, there's this statelessness, there's uh, cosmopolitanism, um, there's a speed with which things change today, uh, which with with ideas and 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 econ economics change that makes it very hard for people to find firm footing. Um, all of this is part of what she calls homelessness and rootlessness, and uh, um, it makes um, modern man. Right? There's a thesis of modernity in our rent that some people find really correct and appealing, and otherwise, other people think is hogwash. Right? Depends on your view on modernity. But um, she definitely has a thesis of modernity that there are changes that are going on and happening that make, well, it doesn't change what it means to be human, alter the, the, the human condition, which is different from human nature in a way that makes men um, different. 
And one of those is this homelessness, which he thinks is now a widespread phenomena amongst um, uh, uh, amongst the human the human race. Um, so in that sense, it's not that it's inevitable uh, uh, at all, right? She thinks that totalitarianism can be uh, emerges when uh, a there is this homelessness, and b the elites and the power structures are corrupted and seem to be not responding to human needs. And then uh, a particular uh, leader emerges who is an adept at um, uh, mobilizing uh, a movement that is totalitarian. And uh, it's not inevitable at all, but it can happen. Uh, and that's what she's pointing out to us. Um, there's a debate going on about the word mob still. Does the German word carry both connotations as well? Um, I'll let Joachim answer that if he has or can. Um, Ackley says, I acknowledge this might be a naive and rather long observation. I love naive and long observations. But Descartes questions common sense as a fundamentally, oh, this is not naive at all. Thank you, Ackley. Um, uh, Descartes questions common sense as a fundamentally inconsistent construction, a weakness that he wants to correct with an appeal to the methods of scientific inquiry. I think that this is a crucial observation that informs Arendt's explanation of how propaganda manipulates facts and a fictional reality. That is an excellent observation, and I don't know if you've read uh, her book, The Human Condition, but in the last uh, section on the Vita Activa and the modern age, actually, um, Arendt. Uh, Argues that the that um, Earth alienation and world alienation, which are two words she then adopts to talk about this idea of homelessness that we have addressed here in this book, um, are rooted in the rise of modern science. And the two figures, the three figures that she spends the most time talking about, are um, Galileo, Descartes, and Leibniz. Um, and uh, it is exactly the fact that science is an attack on common sense, that science says, oh, common sense says the sun stays in, um, uh, that the sun moves around us, but science tells us that the sun is there and the earth moves around the sun. Common sense tells us that our senses are reliable, but science tends to, tells us that what we see is not what we think we see. That science um, is an attack on common sense that um, is thus an attack on our feeling at home and comfortable in the world. And it thus is contributes deeply to this sense of homelessness and rootlessness um, that Arendt is here talking about. So um, uh, if you're interested as a member of the virtual reading group, you can go back and listen to my uh, discussions of uh, the human condition, which we did about a year and a half ago, and uh, listen to those chapters on Descartes um, in the human condition, and, and, uh, and you'll see that I think it's not a silly question at all. You have a long quote from Descartes here, uh, good senses of all things among men, the most equally distributed. Um, in any sense, you're absolutely right to see science as an attack on common sense, leading to this kind of homelessness and rootlessness um, that RN uh, understands uh, as related to totalitarianism. Um, a debate going on still about the word mob. Um, Carolyn writes, I have a religious friend who wants to convert me. When I present facts, she re retreats into God is always in control when it suits his purposes that Trump should be president at this time. <laughs> Fictitious world. Um, well, uh, interesting question. Is religion a, a fictitious world, an ideology? Um, is science a fictitious world, an ideology? Um, uh, both counter common sense. Um, and yet they do so for different reasons um, and in, for, on different grounds. Um, uh, 
but when you're, you know, so when your friend says God is always in control and it suits his purposes that Trump should be president at this time, uh, what can she say? Uh, what can you say? You can say, well, this is called uh, the theodicy, the namely that everything that happens happens for God willed it. And, uh, you know, that means all the evil in the world as well as all the good. Um, and, um, you know, you have to be willing to take all the evil as well as all the good if you're going to make that argument. Um, uh, but after that, it's just a matter of faith. I mean, you can't can't prove it, right? I you want to say something? I do say something after she comes out with that. I say, that is your opinion, but I do not share it. And uh, this is someone I've known for almost all my life, and my parents were religious to some degree, the same way they are. And uh, I tell them that I have a very different idea about, I thought that, now this is a bit of a fiction, but I use it in this case, that we were thrown, God was in control in the Garden of Eden and we got thrown out of there. And that we are supposed to behave well and we are given freedom of will. And this is what I say to her, this is my concept, which was my concept quite a long time ago. It isn't currently. And um, I, I tell her that, you know, you have your opinion, I have mine. That's all I can say to her. Okay, and in, and in a sense, religion is an opinion. Um, uh, and if someone has that opinion, um, what are you gonna, how can you, there's no way you can disprove it just like there's no way she can prove it. Um, you can argue about it, you can accept it, but you can't disprove it um, and she can't prove it. Um, and part of what it means to live in a pluralistic country and pluralistic world is to live among people whose opinions you find either wrong or ridiculous. Um, uh, and so we have to move on uh, and accept people who have opinions different from us. The problem is, is that I know large numbers of people who have this frame of reference and they feel that Trump is their savior. Um, well, that's, you know, once, once, someone, once someone goes to that direction to say Trump is your savior, you know, I would have to say that most religious people would, would have to, would beg to differ. Um, and at that point, you actually have to find religious people who are willing to make the argument that that's a ridiculous claim. Um, he's hardly a messiah, um, and certainly not a religious one. So, but that comes down to arguing with people and uh, and seeking to persuade them. And uh, you know, I don't I don't anticipate. Um, Trump being seen as the next Messiah by most Christians or Muslims or Jews, but maybe I'm wrong. We'll see. Um, um, my savior, I, I didn't quite mean a Messiah. I meant a little uh, less savior than that. <laughs> but still, uh, there are religious people who feel that this sort of change is necessary to bring about the second coming of Jesus and the rule of God's kingdom on earth. I know quite well, a number. I wish them luck, but let me let me take the more serious part of what you're saying. I mean, and, and this goes back to the fellow travelers point of Jacks and Pats and others. There are a lot of people out there who find Trump to be ridiculous and yet either voted for him or didn't vote for him, but are not upset that he was elected. I mean, I've heard this from many people. You know, I didn't vote for him, but he might just be what we need. Right. Um, and I think there's a sense among many people that the system, the two party corrupt political system we live in is just broken. And um, no person who ever will get elected from one of the two main parties will ever fix it because it's gonna take a kind of crazy um, person to do it. And that it may be worth dealing with all of Trump's Michigas is the word that comes to mind, but um, uh, all of Trump's uh, dangerous 
um, disgusting, uh, narcissistic lying, um, and even some of the bad policies that will come about, it may be worth the price. That may be a worthwhile price to pay for breaking up a sclerotic, corrupt, dysfunctional, disenfranchising political and economic system that has led to um, the democratic crisis that we're in. And the hope of these people is that as bad as Trump will be, the system will survive him in some way, and yet he will have created, in breaking parts of it apart, created the room to rebuild it in a more functional way. Um, I think it's a, it's a huge risk. I mean, they know that, some of them, and it, it's clear that it is. Um, and some people think it's worth taking that risk. And I think it's a, to me, that's an interesting and, and, and respectable position, although one that requires of those people taking it an enormous amount of willingness to jump out on the front lines and say no when he goes too far. And uh, if you're going to make that position, you're going to have to be willing to admit you're wrong if he goes too far and be one of the first people putting your physical body on the line to, uh, to prevent it. That's, my, that's what I say to those people. Um, I think one of the negative, Mitch Hampton writes, I think one of the negative forces unleashed in the world today is hyperpolitization. Yeah, thank you. Or the politicization of practically everything which creates a crisis in private life as much as public life. Or a crisis in how we understand even desire for public and private distinction, right? I think both left and right are confused on this. Arendt is noteworthy for her love for the explication of the political and its value. How would Arendt understand this? Would she say that the political itself is being devalued or obliterated? Is there or should there be a space apart from a partisan binary system? Well, the questions today are great. I want to thank all of you guys. I'm, you know, uh, I think as we've gotten more and more into the book, I, I hope that it means that you're really grappling with it because these are really spectacularly good questions. Um, uh, yes, the, 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 one, of the, one of the core ideas of RN is the need for a political world in which there is no truth, but there are facts. There are opinions and facts. And when Mitch here writes of the hyper-politicization of our world on the left and the right, I, I take this to mean, I don't know if you exactly meant it this way, Mitch, but this is how I take it to be, the, um, the fact that on the left and the right, there are increasingly numerous groups peoples and organizations that are convinced that they know what's politically true and that the other side is politically wrong and dangerous and contemptible. And that disagreements become not disagreements, but become deviances from an, orth from an orthodoxy. Um, this is as true right now on the left as it is on the right, and it's a very dangerous, um, uh, a very dangerous situation. Because what we're seeing is um, an evacuation of the people in the middle who are willing to uh, have legitimate arguments. So the, the increasingly intolerant and censorious protests on college campuses of people who disagree with them, whether it's um, uh, Milo Yiannopoulos or, or Charles Murray, um, and the, uh, on the right, the, the just absolute uh, mockery or what we call, what they now call trolling liberals, which is what Lucian Wintrich says he does, of people on the right, um, in which the argument is not, the point is not to make an argument that means something, but simply to um, mock and deride uh, your opponents. On both sides, what you're seeing is an evacuation of politics, which is discussion, debate, persuasion, and argumentation. And the second part of this question that Mitch asks is, is there a place, a space apart from partisan and binary system? And the, while Arendt wanted politics to be a part of it, she also thought it was absolutely essential that there be, part, there be places that were fully 
separate from it. And um, she argues that places like the university, uh, the law, judges, uh, science, um, these are institutions that play a particular role, which is that they seek to develop facts, a common sense in the world, which is not political. Um, and they are the outside of politics, she says in one of her essays called Truth and Politics. Uh, they are the outside of politics um, that, that, that provide the ground, the factual ground upon which legitimate disagreements and political arguments can happen. And one of the great dangers of the late 20th century, from her point of view, was the politicization of the university, the politicization of the law, the politicization of, um, of, of, the, of science, and the potential loss, therefore, of these non-political, outside political uh, groups, which were governed by a search for truth, not just about opinions. And uh, I think one of the real wars going on uh, right now in my culture, right, uh, is in the academy about, you know, since the 60s, there was a rebellion against, uh, by mostly the left, saying that universities should be politicized. And a middle ground, left and right, emerged trying to hold them together as not purely political organizations. And we're in a point right now where a number of students and faculty and some administrators are um, embracing the repoliticization of the university. Um, and thinking that it needs to politicize as a response to the alt-right and to Trump. Um, to me, that's a very dangerous move. And um, uh, yet I think it's one way to see a lot of what's happening right now. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Mitch. Um, Jack, Kim writes about what it mean, or what we mean by synth sympathizers. This is, Arendt is talking here about fellow travelers and uh, people who are not in the party, but are um, maybe sympathetic to it. That's the, that's the word that's being used. Um, Jack writes, the messianic impulse is part of the background of all totalitarian leaders, both in their personal development and in the adherence to their followers. Many totalitarian groups, cults are worth studying. I think that's that's a good point. Um, uh, just like their followers, the, the leaders wanna be part of uh, something significant that matters, right? We talked about Lawrence of Arabia, T. Lawrence in a couple of earlier chapters. Um, People want to be part of something that matters as they increasingly see themselves as secular biological beings that don't have much significance in the world. Um, and the rise of cults uh, is, is part of that. Harold writes, I'm going to try and move a little quickly. It seems Trump will form alliances with whomever will support his intentions in being president perhaps aggregation of wealth and aggrandizement of the self family. Is this the first, is this a first in presidents? I doubt it, uh, but um, I mean, we've had some pretty bad presidents in history and we've had some pretty self aggrandizing presidents in history. Um, but uh, I'll let others, I don't know that fully. Um, I have been struck by the, David Lionel writes, I've been struck by the parallel of Arendt's focus on the totalitarian enemy of a vast conspiracy with Erdogan in Turkey, who has used the pretext of a marginal failed coup to purge tens of thousands of professionals who obviously had nothing to do with the supposed event. Notably, Erdogan very nearly lost the last election. Uh, along with North Korea, I would say Turkey is one of the better examples of a totalitarian uh, country right now, or at least one that's aiming towards totalitarianism if it's not there yet. Um, and uh, these are um, <laughs> these are uh, techniques that 
we should be very much watching because if they are brought home, we're going to have to deal with them at home. Um, and David continues, I deny this equivalence between right-wing populism and left-wing movement. Sanders offers very specific programs that will serve the interests of the mass of people. Um, okay, so I didn't say Sanders. Um, uh, whether or not Sanders offers specific programs that would serve the interests of the mass of the people or not, I don't know. Um, uh, you know, he offered a lot of programs, um, many of which uh, were fantasy and some of which were real. Um, uh, I know people can disagree about, you know, his programs, but he himself, uh, I would not call totalitarian. I do think he was ideological at times. Um, but not in any way totalitarian. That said, there were people who were amongst his supporters, right, um, who often uh, uh, enforced a kind of ideological conformity that was um, uh, totalitarian in form, right? So that if you were ever question Sanders or for people who su supported Hillary, um, the response was, you don't, you're contemptible, you don't know anything. You, in a sense, you you were almost a non-person. Um, and uh, I experienced that personally, and I know many of my friends experienced it personally. Um, uh, I see it on the left at college campuses and on Facebook. Um, people who uh, dissent from certain viewpoints are, in a sense, unfriended, uh, uh, ostracized, called, you know, collaborators, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, is this, the, I, I, there's a difference, right? Which is that I don't see any real powerful le leaders of this movement on the left um, uh, embracing this view. I think it's, I think it's a view of a largely decentralized group, but uh, it's not it's not without power and it's not without influence. And I can tell you that it's had enormous power and influence on college campuses, which is where it's um, which is where its base of operations has become the uh, success of this movement in a preventing speakers from speaking, disinviting speakers they don't like, but also um, making it such that people who disagree with anything of that movement. Um, are unwilling to speak. I mean, I have students come up to me, come up to colleagues all the time and say they don't feel comfortable expressing their opinions on campus because they are either centrist or right of center or, God forbid, a Trump supporter. And um, there is no doubt uh, a kind of groupthink that is that has emerged in certain places on the left. Um, Okay, you may disagree with me, David, and I'm happy to have that you know, argument. And if you want to you know, contact me and, and talk about it, I'm happy to do it. Um, but I wasn't trying to say that it's an equivalent. Um, and yet, I do think that the people who refuse to let Charles Murray speak um, are as living in a factually, uh, uh, in, in a bubble, defactualized bubble as much as the alt-right is. And I think that there's very little that separates them from the alt-right, except narcissism of small differences. Um, and I know that that will upset some of you and set many on the left, uh, but it's, it's, it's a truth that I think has to be said these days, because if we're going to be, if we're going to oppose the alt-right and Trump, we're going to need credibility from the middle. And the only way we're going to get credibility from the middle is by, um, uh, is by being willing to 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 be honest on both sides, um, and to me that's a deeply important uh, political position these days. Radical centrism. Carolyn, I have also read and benefited from Charles Murray's work. His book, uh, his book, uh, coming apart. I think is a book everyone should read, and I've taught it at Bard, and I'll tell you the students love it. I mean, you know, we can criticize it, but they think it's a great book to read. And I invited him to speak at Bard and he gave a keynote address and he was great. And people loved him. The idea that you won't even let the guy speak 
by the way, you know, he's he's one of the he's one of the never Trumpers. He's on record as never supporting Trump. And yet he's someone that we are not even willing to hear from today. Which to me is really problematic. Um, I don't know, David Lionel, I don't know if you're still on, but if you want to respond, I'm happy to let you do so. We have five minutes. Maybe David got, are you there, David, or not? No? Uh, Roger, we only have a few minutes left. But the one part of this chapter that we haven't talked about very much today mm -hmm. is the part about organization. And I wonder if um, I wonder if there's anybody in the in the group who wants to speak to that, or if you'd like to make some remarks about it before we shut down. Okay, so th thanks. I don't know if you, did I don't know if you had a chance to to listen to the to the video I, that was sent around on Wednesday. Um, I talked a fair bit about the the organization chapter in that video. Um, and so if you want more, you can always go there. But in, in, in it, 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 she, she basically is arguing here that once you have, in a sense, made the masses malleable through propaganda, um, uh, the key to organiz the key to totalitarian movement, much more so than propaganda is organization. And she, 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 she offers a number of different um, ways that you organize. One is what she calls these front organizations, which surround the movement's membership. So these are the fellow travelers. This is on page 366 to 367. Um, and they provide the movement with a mist of normalcy, right? And that's on 367. Um, then there's the elite formations, the SA and the SS, which she talks about on 367 through 368, which um, are not really about military or anything else, but they're about um, providing uh, a kind of absolute movement uh, conformity and ideological uh, conformity of radicalized people who will keep the radicalization of the movement alive. Um, then she talks about this duplication of institutions that in um, all institutions like the teachers unions or the lawyers unions um, are duplicated and you create an alternate teachers union and that's a way that you can destroy the uh, status quo without even using violence. And um, then what you do is you create multiple teachers unions and whichever one is most loyal to you at any given time, that is the one you support. Um, then she talks about how the leader is the core center of this movement that swings it into motion and that the core value of the leader is his ability, his detail orientedness and the devotedness that they have to questions of personnel, creating loyalty and personal loyalty. And, and that the leader creates this loyal world around himself and that he plays a double function, she then says, on the one hand, um, focused inwards, speaking to the movement and protecting it against the slanders of the outside world. And on the other hand, facing outward to the outside world and letting the outside world know that the movement is not as unconnected to the outside world as might be thought to, to be the case. Um, and that put this all together, these, these movements are like secret societies um, that, uh, that, that work very much in that way and they create these little internal worlds. Uh, which are fictional. And um, these are the different techniques of loyalty, which leads to, as she will say on 382, the chief value of the organization is to safeguard the fictional world through consistent lying. Right? And, and that leads us to pages 383 to 385, what I was reading from earlier in the session today. So um, these are, uh, that's, that's why, that's how organizations work and why they're so important. Do you want to add to that, Jack? I just want to, yes, I did. I, I'm, 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 I personally, I'm interested in um, the rise uh, both in 
uh, Stalin's, uh, Stalin's Soviet Union and in Hitler's Germany of um, uh, police organizations, statewide police organizations that operate both in public and in secret, namely the NKVD and the Gestapo. And the reason I bring them up is because they're critical parts of the totalitarian organization, critical. Yeah. And in the U.S. today, we're seeing something like that being uh, developed in ICE. So yeah. um, the, uh, so the, the, the some, people, some of the people in ICE have spoken about being unleashed, unleashed. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, um, and, and we see them stopping people in the streets and stuff like that. I think we need to think clearly about what the role of ICE might be in the developing situation. I think it's a great point, and that's a great transition because in Chapter 12, which we're going to read, so so for everyone who knows, we're taking a two-week break. I apologize, but I'm traveling a lot, um, and I will not have reliable interconnections next week. And then the week after that, we have an RN conference at Bard that I have to be at. So we're going to meet, skip two weeks, but this gives you plenty of time to read Chapter 12. Uh, and the second part of Chapter 12 is called the Secret Police. And it's about totalitarianism and power and the role that the secret police uh, plays in them. And um, I think uh, we will have a great opportunity to talk about that in two weeks. The last thing I want to point out is that tomorrow I'll have a 7,000 word essay coming out on Arendt and Trump in the Los Angeles Review of Books. Um, for those of you who get the Amor Mundi, I'll certainly provide a link to it. But I hope you have a chance to, um, to read it. And uh, please send me your feedback on it if you'd like, and I'm um, happy to hear any comments. And then please pass it around if you think it's, it's, it's worth it. Um, uh, that will, I hope, keep you busy a little bit in the two weeks that we're not going to be meeting. I'll miss you all. But uh, I hope you have a good two weeks and look forward in three weeks, I guess, um, to getting going on the last two chapters of the book, which are extraordinary chapters. And we're going to have a lot to talk about. Thank you all very much. Enjoy.